I'm Fumi Feto, this is On Reflection, the beauty podcast with a global view on beauty in association with Sunday Riley, certified B Corp, cruelty-free skincare, powered by science, balanced by botanicals. Later in the show, I'll be speaking with photographer Alexandra Lees about her new book, Mia Mine, which celebrates the power of the nude female body. But first, required reading. This is the section of the show where we discuss beauty news and features that have piqued our interest. Joining me for this is Sonia Harrier, the beauty director of The Telegraph. Sonia, welcome. Hi, Femi. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you so much for coming on. So I love the breadth of stories that you chose this week. Let's start with the piece in Allure, which is the interview with Ellie Goldstein. So she featured in a Gucci Beauty and Vogue Italia partnership. And then Gucci Beauty, they posted it on their Instagram and it went viral. And I know for anyone else who's listening to this, they'll think, well, okay, yeah, big deal. But the difference is this 18-year-old model from Essex has Down syndrome which is something that we've never really seen before in campaigns and in the beauty space. Tell me what drew you to this story. The digital cover story that I have chosen is part of the beauty of accessibility story for for a law. And Ellie is the cover star of that campaign. It's just very refreshing. It's so refreshing to see a beautiful woman in mainstream media who's representing a different type of beauty. You know, it's extremely refreshing to see. She's from Ilford in Essex. She's now on the cover of an American magazine in their digital edition. She's done this amazing Gucci Vogue Italia partnership. And I really hope that it signals a change in how things are happening at the moment and how models are cast. Because reading the interview with Ellie, she wanted to be famous and She's a dancer and she loves modelling and she seems like she's got such a great passion for it and for the fashion industry, which is a brilliant thing in itself. Zebedee Management is her management company and they are trying to push models that haven't been given an opportunity before or haven't perhaps seen themselves reflected in the cover of fashion and beauty magazines before and in fashion and and makeup campaigns now there's an amazing you know 18 year old model who is the first major model with down syndrome to be so brilliantly celebrated also the pictures are just incredible she just looks gorgeous doesn't she yeah she looks amazing these days when people are talking about diversity and representation they forget that it's not just about the color of your skin or ethnicity it covers so much And it's quite extraordinary when you think about it, that people who are not able-bodied, as it were, or have certain disabilities are excluded from so much of the conversation because they don't fit that mould of beauty, the mould of beauty that we've been taught and brainwashed to believe is the ideal of beauty. Her agency was set up by two women and one of them was a social worker. The other one worked in performing arts teaching young people with disabilities. And they launched the agency because they felt that people with visible differences and disabilities were not given the same opportunities. And I think it's really quite incredible that they've managed to achieve this because this is something that we don't see very often and people don't even really talk about it. The fashion industry, and I would say beauty as well, of course, you know, they're very slow to embrace anyone who doesn't really fit the mould. I was reading in the piece, actually, that the head booker, Sue Moore, Zebedee's head booker, said that she would get quite a lot of negativity, even up till recently. She said she'd pitch talent to brands for potential campaigns and they'd say, no, I don't think we're ready for that yet. It's quite extraordinary, really. I do think that this is an opportunity for brands to open their minds and open their eyes to what beauty is and what beauty can be. I was reading this piece and I was thinking about the concept of beauty and who represents that. You know, that whole thing around the golden ratio, which is basically this scientific measure of perfection. I mean, when you think about it, really, it's nonsensical. And people use science to claim that this is what determines whether you are beautiful or not. And it determines who fits into the constructs of beauty and and what that represents. So it's kind of nice to see brands, you know, like Gucci Beauty in this instance and Vogue Italia, who are not towing the line and just showing beauty 
in a way that we've always seen. I think it's it's great that we're seeing something different. Absolutely. And like you say, you know, the golden triangle and the golden proportions, really, when it all boils down to it, it's just very insulting, isn't it? It's almost like if you haven't got this, you know, perfectly symmetrical face, by definition, you're not considered to be as beautiful as someone who who does, which I feel like is such an outdated concept now. There is beauty in so many different types of people and faces and I think what's incredible is that now if I feel like the tide is turning in terms of diversity on all aspects of beauty and it really should be celebrated. That said I do think that it will take some time. I do think that this is a really wonderful thing and a great indication of what is possible but I do feel that so much will have to change in order for models like Ellie yeah. to be seen in a way that isn't other. It should be a case of when we have models like Ellie fronting campaigns that we don't really even think about it, people's mindsets around what is defined as beautiful will have to change. Absolutely, yes. And it's, you know, it's the first step in in quite a big challenge and like you say, it's totally a mindset thing, isn't it, for for so many people to now almost drop the fact that, you know, it's someone with Down syndrome who is fronting a campaign and rather it's just someone who's beautiful fronting a campaign. That's a, a real shift that will probably take some time. Let's go on to the next piece. This is from Cosmetic Business and it basically says that John Lewis has forecasted the expectation that consumers will be buying fewer beauty products next year. So for anyone who is listening from abroad, John Lewis is one of our sort of national treasures. It's a huge department store that sells lots and lots of beauty brands and lots of other things that everyone has in their home and in their lives. So when they say something, people pay attention. I just thought I'd put it out there. So tell me, Sonia, what are your thoughts around this piece? I just found this really interesting. I'm hugely interested in anything um, to do with kind of forecasting or consumer habits and and that sort of thing. And it makes up a lot of the content that we do at The Telegraph, especially for our digital pieces. What I found really interesting is it's almost like we're going back to that whole kind of idea of the lipstick index. You know, when there's a recession and we are in recession now, you know, if you can't buy the Chanel handbag, you can buy the Chanel bronzer. And if you can't buy the expensive jacket or a new you know anything really indulgent there are always those kind of little indulgences of beauty what I did find interesting in particular though is that they forecast that consumers will buy fewer beauty products so I guess it's that whole notion of where fashion has been moving to or has certainly wanted to move towards in the last few years buy fewer but buy better mantra so it's that almost kind of investment dressing but for your makeup and your beauty products on one hand that's great and in a real ideological way it's brilliant you know it's more sustainable there's less waste we are probably using our products for longer and finishing them and really sort of enjoying that whole consumer experience of having really indulgent beauty products so on one hand that's great but also I do believe that beauty is about exploration and it's fun and it should be fun I think there's definitely still a place for that play with beauty and I I feel like that magic shouldn't be lost but I do feel like our sort of consumer mindset is probably shifting slightly we serve at the Telegraph mainly a sort of 35 plus reader who perhaps does want to spend a little bit more money on fewer pieces when it comes to their beauty products and their skincare products so this whole idea certainly resonates with our reader But there's always still going to be a place for those kind of quick, like, oh, let's just pop into Boots and I fancy buying a bright new red lipstick to cheer me up. But perhaps we are seeing a slight shift away from the fast aspect of consumer spending and perhaps spending a little bit more, but for fewer products and really cherishing that indulgence in beauty and that indulgence that you can get from a beauty product. I think on one hand, I see people certainly spending less. I think we're in a time now where the economic stability of the country and of the world is in question. I think people are conscious of their future. They're conscious of their own financial stability. 
But then I think it was really interesting over the period of lockdown, for instance, the skincare sales went through the roof because I think that in, in times of hardship and I think maybe tying to that lipstick index, although it wasn't lipstick that was the star, it was more skincare. Yeah. But tying into that, people wanted escapism. They wanted the comfort that they got from the sensorial aspect of skincare and products because we were in such a hard place and we're still going through it now. And I do think that, yes, people are mindful of the environment, but I do think that with the pandemic, thoughts around waste and sustainability took something of a backseat. Yeah. But then also adding to that is the conversation that's been ongoing about this multi-layered approach to skincare, that's starting to give way to something that's a little bit more considered and more minimal, because essentially we were just using way too many products and had way too many steps and way too many layers, which is now why you're seeing so many brands are releasing products that are all about looking after your skin barrier because we've been destroying it for years. So I do think that there are certain other things that might influence people's spending habits. I, I don't know whether people will completely move away from just not buying products because they're thinking about the environment. I think it might be financially driven and also them thinking about what's best for their skin. It is an opportunity for beauty companies to think about what they are churning out and how much they are churning out, not just from the environmental side of things. You know, their their production cycle is really intense. And I personally can't keep up. And I think that has started to become quite overwhelming for the customer. It's given people decision fatigue. And yeah. right now, there's so many other things to think about. We're in such a strange headspace and life feels harder than ever. And perhaps people are simply craving ease and simplicity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like there's almost two schools here. We find that many of our readers are quite content with just having a very signature capsule makeup bag. So they will always have a coral blusher in their makeup bag, whether it's from Hourglass or from Maybelline, and always have a red lipstick. And, and they kind of know what works for them. And that essentially drives their consumer spending. However, I think it is quite difficult now to almost see the wood from the trees with the, with many of the beauty products, because like you say, there is so much out there at so many different price points that I certainly get overwhelmed with the amount of new launches that there are every week. And as a consumer, I can imagine that being quite overwhelming. Hopefully the time will come where there's less churn of beauty products because I don't know if there's going to be an appetite for that in years to come. Yeah and like you said buying fewer and better is much more well it's financially prudent and if it forces brands to think about what they're churning out and create products that people do want to buy regularly without having a plethora of choices which invariably just confuses them, then I, I don't think that that's such a bad thing. Okay, let's go to our third and final piece. And this is quite a big piece. This is a piece by Stella Bugby in The Cut, and it's called Our Shared Unsharing. Instagram couldn't handle 2020 either. I mean, there is so much to unpack here. Talk to me about why you chose it. I just found this piece really interesting. It sort of reflects back on 2020 and how social media has played quite a massive part in our lives and how many people have had this collective shared fatigue of Instagram. And there's been so many huge events of the year, whether it's a black square on your Instagram feed back in June or it showing support for a political party. It's essentially boiling down, actually, why are we really doing that? What thought process is behind us doing that? Also, on, a, on another hand, have we become a nation of oversharers? The writer finds herself reflecting about this over and over again. And she ends up archiving many of her pictures because she almost cringes at the fact that she was oversharing so much. And, you know, it's that whole kind of cry for validation. Why are we posting so much? Why are we sharing so much? Have we come to a point now where we need to perhaps stop oversharing so much of our lives on social media? 
I don't agree or disagree with her in terms of whether we are a nation of oversharers and whether we have passed the point, because I don't think we have. But it was certainly a very interesting read for the current state of play of how coming to the end of 2020, how important social media has been for us this year. I think it's interesting that you say that I don't think we've passed the point of oversharing. I think you're probably a much more patient person than I am. I feel like we passed the point of oversharing quite a while ago. (laughs) But but like you, I thought this was a really interesting piece and quite a reflective piece. And from a beauty standpoint or in terms of how we consider our sense of self, she raised quite a few really interesting points. You know, she talked about how there was so much that we used to do, the values that we came to expect and enjoy in this time of social discord suddenly felt inappropriate. And one of the things she mentioned was narcissism. And, you know, the thing is with social media and with Instagram, it really encourages that narcissistic aspect of people's characters. At this point in time, there's certain elements of narcissism and being so obsessed with self has started to seem a little bit more tone deaf. But she also mentioned how Instagram has become an approximation of who we are. And I thought that was really interesting, how we use our posts to reinforce what we tell ourselves about ourselves or who we are. And it's like a, a mirror of yourself that's not necessarily real, but one you create about yourself. So, yeah, like you say, you know, there wasn't a sort of right or wrong or agree or disagree, but it was just a lot to think about and also to consider the way we're engaging with social media is that impact in how we see ourselves. Because in many ways, Instagram is a curated reality. We are sharing what we want people to see. We are not sharing everything. We are sharing what we want people to see about us and what we represent, and who we are, and who we look like. And we are, in many ways, whether you're thinking about it or not, we are intentional in terms of how we do that. I'm guilty of doing it myself. I, If I take a picture that I like, I will post it. And that is, you know, there's a form of narcissism there. But I feel like it's on such a huge scale, isn't it now? Are we all sort of validating each other through our comments and our likes? I guess there's a lot to unpick in terms of the massive impact that social media is having. And it's so subtle. It's just a subtle, quiet impact that it does impact how we see ourselves and how we see other people. And like you say, it's that whole kind of curating your own reality. When you were talking about this, it suddenly reminded me of a conversation I had with a friend a few years ago. And, you know, if you look at her social media, she looks like she's having the most wonderful time. You know, she's posting these glorious selfies of herself and looking really beautiful and so on. And in real life, her her life was nothing like that. And she was saying that she posts those things specifically to help her. So it's not about gaining validation from other people. It's more about her being able to look at it and get some joy from it. And almost it being a kind of escapism from what she was dealing with outside of the gaze of social media. So I thought that was quite interesting as well. This piece, and I would encourage everyone to read it, and we'll have it on the website. There'll be a link to it on the ORB podcast website, so you can have a read of it. But it does raise a lot of questions about image, about how we see ourselves, and how, without necessarily thinking about it, how we require the validation of others as a natural thing. Definitely gave me quite a lot of food for thought. And that's it for Required Reading this week. Sonia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Finley. Thank you for having me. It's now time for Impraisal. This is a section of the show where we hail the merits of a single beauty product. This week, it's Sunday Riley's Lunar Sleeping Night Oil. Pores, breakouts, and skin so greasy you can fry an egg on it. Back in the day, this is what I associated with face oils. Oils to me were terrifying. Oils were the enemy. Oils were a no-no. 
because when you have skin that can pump out enough oil to keep the oil industry afloat, what do you know? You don't want any more oil. But before you sideline oils, it's worth remembering they're not all created equal and knowledge is power, as is Luna by Sunday Riley. This to me is one of the cleverest and most intriguing oil formulations because it's nothing like its old school counterparts. Yes, to the naked eye, it looks and it feels like an oil, but on the skin, it behaves like a retinol. But this is next level, next generation retinol with skin plumping avocado seed and chia seed oils. And it does a myriad of things. It eases the appearance of wrinkles, fine lines, age spots, uneven texture, dryness, dullness, And as the formula also includes blue tansy and green chamomile, hence the glorious shade of bluey green, it calms stress out skin and is incredibly soothing. And unlike your run-of-the-mill retinol, it's less likely to cause irritation. And no, it doesn't clog your pores. It doesn't give you breakouts and it's minus zero on the grease factor. Instead, it leaves your skin hydrated, leaves it looking incredible, and it does it all while you sleep. So this, my friends, is an oil that I can most definitely get with. In fact, I kind of think that calling it an oil is doing it a disservice. So you can just call it by its name, Luna, or you can just call it Genius. Now, Talking Points. Nudes have traditionally and historically been captured by men, used for male pleasure and viewed via the male gaze. A new book by photographer Alexandra Lees has flipped this on its head by featuring 44 images of nude women, including herself, which not only celebrates the female body in and of itself, but celebrates women's autonomy over their own bodies. She joins me now to talk all about it. Alex, welcome to the show. Hi, so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. No, so brilliant to have you. So this project was shot entirely over Zoom during lockdown. Talk to me about how it came about and what inspired it. The project began in April, a few weeks into the global lockdown. I began by photographing myself first. I think it was because I was alone with my body and thoughts a lot more than usual. And so I was interested in exploring the relationship I had with it. I liked the idea of exploring it with my camera and trying to understand my true relationship with my body and whether I could actually be truly comfortable naked, even with myself, and whether I could be kinder to myself by getting familiar with every single part of me. Also, in a way, it came out of a desire for connection and community during a time that felt increasingly isolating. So tell me about the women that you also shot. Who are these women? Because you have a plethora of women, all shapes, all sizes, lots of different nationalities um, from all over the globe. Tell me about these women, how you found them and what their stories were. So I began the project with myself, as I just mentioned. I then reached out to my friends and then my friends' friends and then people I knew in different countries and people I reached out through Instagram. And I think people often ask me why these women or what was I specifically looking for? And I think, I don't think at the time it was, it was that conscious necessarily, but reflecting back on it, I think I'm naturally drawn to women who aren't afraid to be vulnerable, who are quietly confident in a way or self-assured in who they are and what they are about and by accepting and working on and overcoming their insecurities, there's a strength to them that you can feel in their energy. And it also translates in how they hold themselves. So I think I kind of just knew when I saw them or saw their images or met them that they were someone that I found inspiring and wanted to photograph. I love that it's yet again, another way of coming against what beauty standards have traditionally told us is acceptable or beautiful. All the bodies that I've seen in the book, all the bodies I'm seeing, they don't fit the mold. The poses don't fit the mold. The faces don't fit the mold. The shapes don't fit the mold. We're seeing body hair. We're seeing belly rolls. We're seeing nipple piercings. I'm guessing this is all very deliberate. I'd I'd love to know your thoughts and your reasoning behind this. I think the fact that we have a mold is what has caused so much damage to our perceptions of ourselves in the first place. 
So I think it was important for me to go against what we have been taught that mold is. It's made us believe that if we don't fit into it, there's something ugly or wrong with us. And I think this lie has been told to us over and over again. The truth is that every person and every body is different. Not one person is the same. So, you know, even though this project doesn't include every single body or every type of beauty there is out there, it was important for me to show a snippet of the beautiful and myriad ways bodies can look about recognizing everybody is different and not we then shouldn't compare to one another, but also being able to find unity and being able to relate to one another and and sharing an understanding of what it means to be a woman that crosses cultures. In terms of the poses, I wanted to show that we can feel beautiful when we're happy and safe and comfortable, especially within nude photography, a lot of the work out there still plays into the expectation of the male gaze when it comes to our poses and how we hold ourselves. I wanted to ask the question, like, what if we didn't do that? Can we still feel sexy and good about ourselves when we are relaxed and more true to who we really are? I wanted to really explore this and show women that they could be. Yeah, you have mentioned that in interviews that the male gaze has taught women to hold themselves in a certain way. And I I was thinking about that and wanted to know a little bit more about your thinking behind it. You know, whether you still really believe that women automatically act differently in front of a camera held by a man. And I say that also because, of course, there are lots of female photographers who have trained under male photographers. And I wondered whether you think that they may have inadvertently adopted the male gaze. So perhaps having a female photographer doesn't instinctively mean that she will shoot any differently just because she has a female subject. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I don't think it's as simple as women will act differently in front of a man just because he's a man. I I think there are obviously always going to be other factors at play. But I do think it's a very complex topic, as you mentioned. I always wonder whether we can fully separate ourselves from the effects of the male gaze as it's been held at a superior standing for so long. And it's so deeply ingrained into every aspect of our society. It informs how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive others, what we find beautiful. Even what we think is right and wrong has been shaped by the male gaze for centuries. Though having said that, I do really believe that, you know, no man will ever know what it's like to be a woman. This is our truth and it, and the most honest representation of what it's like to be us. Even if those experiences are somewhat informed by the male gaze, it will always be unique to us. You talked about you being featured in the book also and I was interested to know whether as someone who's not been as someone who's not used to being the subject you're usually behind the camera you're the one who's telling the story as opposed to being the story did you feel quite exposed I definitely felt quite exposed but you know as I said at the beginning this whole project started with me wanting to go on this journey with myself and kind of explore the relationship I had with my body. And in that sense, I was already ready to step outside my comfort zone and be vulnerable in that way. I've never really fully been comfortable being vulnerable. So it did take a lot of courage in that sense. I think being vulnerable takes courage. I was never taught that growing up. I don't know if many of us are, but I think when you do it and you kind of open yourself up to it it is also a very empowering feeling you're british chinese and you lived in hong kong up until the age of 11 before moving to london and i'm just interested to know how much of your upbringing and where you grew up and how you grew up how much that influences the work you do now i know you had a documentary series that you created prior to this project called the boys of hong kong which explores the stereotypes around Asian masculinity. And that was a very obvious link to your 
heritage. But I just wondered whether any of that has inspired all the other work that you do around the issue of identity and relationship with our bodies. And I guess I wanted to know more also about how the female body is viewed and how femininity is viewed and contrasting that with what you've been brought up to believe or or how you've been brought up to view those things and consider those things. I think growing up in Hong Kong, they there tended to be more conservative or rigid, I would say, views of gender. And so I was always confronted with that maybe a lot more than if I lived, well, I mean, I, I don't know because I didn't live, I didn't grow up in London, but I guess, I guess I'm comparing it to the kind of bubble that I exist in now where it seems a lot less rigid and a lot more open when it comes to gender and gender stereotypes. I always found it quite frustrating. So it sort of informed how I want to express myself through my work and explore those topics. Was there any point at all where creating these images or working with these women to create these images felt kind of voyeuristic or odd? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of webcam joke references, but I think, you know, I think it was odd at first. I think everyone, it was new to everyone and you had this kind of added barrier between you and it's not the smoothest of processes having to get the women to move the laptop or the phone for me as I directed them it was it was you know it wasn't very smooth in that sense so it relied on 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 clear communication and understanding between us and sometimes there was even this language barrier but I think once we got into it and found like a comfortable place you kind of forgot about it and you focused on just creating something special together I think in terms of standout moments, I would say that a lot of those were the conversations that I had with each of them. Sometimes they were super nervous and then after they felt really excited and kind of confident and felt good about themselves. And that was like a really rewarding thing for me. I would say one of the most memorable moments and conversations that really stuck with me was one that I had with Suai, who... I met through this project who actually wrote the forward with me and has now actually become a good friend of mine, which is really amazing that you can kind of build these relationships via the internet. She said to me how it's really important and meaningful for her to be part of a project like this as a trans woman, because cis women, particularly cis white women, have for so long been gatekeepers of what a woman should be. We were talking around the time that horrible situation with J.K. Rowling was happening in regards to trans women. But, you know, this is their reality, not just when J.K. Rowling hits the headlines. And I think it really hit home how important intersectional feminism is and just how crucial it is that we look after one another. The truth is that the patriarchal system has affected us at so many different levels. Talk to me about the decision to tie in the proceeds of the book to specific organizations? So the organizations are organizations which women within the project are directly involved in. I think I was aware of how collaborative this process was and how grateful I was to the women and being part of this community. It felt like a perfect way to both support them, the wider community of women, and also support the causes I really believe in and believe that should be brought to light or should have light shed on them. So those organizations are Black Trans Femmes in the Arts Collective, the Trans Law Center, and Rape and Sexual Abuse Support Center. I know that you have talked in the past about wanting to create work that has a wider impact on society. I'd love you to share what you would say is the key purpose of this book. What message would you like it to send out to the world? I hope people can find a way to relate to it in whatever way that might be, to understand its sentiment and to be inspired and comforted by it. I hope they can feel a sense of community and that it encourages people to continue on their own journeys to self-acceptance and empowerment. I'd like to actually end by reading a note from your forward, which I thought was really powerful. 
You said across many regions and cultures, though it doesn't represent every kind of body and beauty out there, this product is us sending nudes to ourselves, not to be consumed, but to be revered. Each woman has a unique evolving relationship with her body. And what we have in common is being alongside one another on the path to loving our bodies, how we choose, despite the battles we face. I thought those words were powerful and beautiful and thought provoking. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the book is Me and Mine by Alexandra Lees and it's out now. Alex, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. And that's it for this week. Please do visit us on orbpodcast.com for links to all the articles we discussed. And if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to our weekly newsletter. My thanks to Sonia Harrier, Alex Lees, this week's brand partner Sunday Riley, and to you for listening to On Reflection. Reflection.